Okay, so I think we can start. So welcome to the um, third invited talk in this conference. So I'm, it's, it's my pleasure to that um, Nikolai Bjorner will give today the, the talk uh, about um, use of SMT solving in, in optimization. Um, Nikolai is, is a researcher in Microsoft Research and um, he uh, is mainly interested in automated steering through proving and software engineering. Um, he's very well known for his solver, SMT solver uh, Z3, uh, which also won several awards. So this solver won the ACM Ciclan Award, TACAS ETAPS, and uh, Nikolai also won the CADE 2019 Headband Award. So he has been very, together with a colleague, but, and he has been very, very active um, in this area of SMT solving and uh, automated uh, theory proving. So as we saw in the in the talks on Monday, um, SMT solving is used a lot for verification and so on, but also in optimization. So we are uh, very happy to have you here, and I'm especially happy that you managed to come to Vienna. So you decided, I think, ten days ago from from Seattle. So it's very nice to have you here, and we are looking forward to your talk. Yeah. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Yes, I, I'm uh, really pleased to uh, be in person and, and meet people who uh, do uh, optimization and scheduling uh, for real. Um, I will be talking about one experience over the past year working with a automobile uh, manufacturer, uh, North American uh, manufacturer of automobiles um, on their plant configuration. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of scheduling problem. Uh, and uh, in, in this context, uh, uh, we learned uh, some, some insights, uh, I believe, uh, on uh, using the techniques that were developed in the context of SMT solvers for the typical program verification uh, methods, uh, but then applied them uh, to um, the, the configuration space. And I hope that there are some uh, takeaways uh, from these uh, say uh, methods that we employ here that, that are uh, somewhat um, that, that, are, that you um, that are, you, I believe don't you don't find typically in the methods I've seen in the conference. So there will be two parts to the talk. Um, uh, but before I continue, I just want to say that I'm, I'm extra pleased that to be in person because uh, I can see that the speakers are supplied with their uh, personal, stash of alcohol <laughs> uh, so uh, if everything anything goes wrong just uh, all right so so i'll give an um introduction and overview of set three and and more generally smt and uh, during the uh, conference there were the uh, it breaks there were uh, these questions you know how what's the relationship with between uh, constraint programming and smt and more specifically, what's the difference between methodologies so or methods, techniques used for solving uh, SMT problems? And I will make a, a case that uh, the <coughs> core techniques that have been used in SMT solvers uh, since the SAT breakthroughs um, are essentially uh, the same as you will find in CP SAT these days. Um, so um, the the uh, the second part of the talk will be on the case study and there. The details on the case study is in, in the proceedings. Uh, I'll give a high level overview of the case study. So now to position uh, SMT and set three, um, it's really built for um, computations, for, for logic, um, for logical analysis of programs. So the, the slogan is that uh, the logic is the calculus of computation. And uh, so if we look at uh, differential and integral calculus, it's used for dynamics and, and conduction and, and um, so thermodynamics and, and so on. And there are tools, uh, MATLAB and Simulink and Mathematica and others that are uh, geared uh, towards uh, those uh, engineering domains. On the other hand, uh, computation, uh, where you reason about program states with invariance, and this is taken from a uh, uh, paper uh, where Turing uh, foreshadowed uh, program verification in the late 40s. Uh, so this, this example comes from the paper and it really has a notation on variance of program states. Uh, so C3 was built for reasoning about programs for generating test uh, 
cases of programs of symbolic uh, symbolic uh, symbolic um, search of program path, uh, paths. Um, and uh, I make a claim that to nowadays, practically all um, program analysis tools you will find uh, in the um, research and industry community use uh, solving logical formulas at, at some stage, and, and many use uh, set three and other SMT solvers. Uh, so set three is available on GitHub. Um, it, it takes uh, a text or programmatic API as input. Um, and the formalism is again geared towards what you find in programs. So it has support for data types that you find in software. And, uh, and then it maps uh, th these representations to uh, it, an efficient search algorithm portfolio uh, with uh, de dedicated uh, sub solvers that are tuned for those uh, domains you find in the, so uh, in the software. You can get different kinds of answers. The, the, the most um, prominent use of SMT solvers have been to uh, prove validity. So uh, essentially check infeasibility of constraints um, or get a solution when the constraints are satisfiable. Getting optimal solutions uh, isn't a um, uh, say primary focus, uh, but uh, but I've added uh, the capability to also uh, uh, solve under objectives uh, some years ago. Uh, another use is, is on consequence generation, I'll mention that a little bit later. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a uh, theme that goes through in the uh, solvers. Uh, they, they exploit um, uh, the, the same uh, duality you will find in core uh, CDCL SAT solvers uh, these days, uh, it, uh, they, they try to extend a partial solution to a full solution. When they can't extend the partial solution to a full solution, you have a conflict. Then conflict resolution or conflict analysis, as it's known in the SAT community, kicks in and you get uh, a part of an infeasible uh, pr proof of infeasibility. And the, uh, and the cycle continues. So they, they really, uh, enjoy, enjoy a feedback loop. And uh, now it's not only the SAT solver that uses uh, this uh, or exploits this uh, duality, it, it, uh, it's repeated uh, throughout. And then uh, another part of engineering it is, is uh, benchmarking. And the benchmark sets in the SAT commun uh, SMT community uh, have been quite helpful in developing uh, uh, the, the solver. So, um, but it also means that uh, the tuning is according to those benchmarks that are, let's say, contributed by the SMT community. Um, I would uh, position SMT as you know the, the most expressive and and, and uh, fairly efficient. Uh, that can of course always be uh, disputed. But since I'm the speaker and this is my slide, uh, the the main thing to to notice is that. Uh, I, I claim that SMT solving uh, borrows and steals uh, techniques found uh, in the SAT, MIP, and, and, and CP communities. So uh, the the core search engines in, in practically um, all, all modern SMT solvers since two thousand and and one or two have been based on CDCL SAT solving, and um, and then to solve uh, arithmetic constraints. It uses dual simplex, uh, uh, so, so MIP uh, technologies with branch and bound and cuts uh, to, to get uh, efficient search uh, constraint propagation. So uh, propagating um, uh, as much as you can uh, cheaply is extremely useful. Um, and uh, I, I, would say, I would claim that CPSAT is essentially an SMT solver, but tuned for the OR community. On the other hand, set three uh, is, is, uh, has some aspiration to solve OR problems. Um, I, I wouldn't claim that it's tuned for OR problems uh, generally. Uh, so the, uh, to summarize, the main um, service of the SMT solver is, is to support these domains of the, you find in hardware and software analysis. Uh, it, Something different 
or di differentiated <laughs> from the uh, CP uh, world, I think is is the the holy grail of SMT is this uh, how you combine disjoint uh, algorithms or solvers. So uh, a, th a theory, uh, and here is some uh, theories listed. So you can have a theory of algebraic data types. You can have a theory of integers, and uh, each of them have a solver. And the question is then. If you have a formula that integrates both integers and algebraic data types, how do they reconcile uh, what they're solving? So this is really the, the holy grail of SMT uh, and, and has received a lot of attention. And then uh, SMT solvers also use this uh, to help proof assistance. So there's a, a market in, in solving quantified and, and even higher order quantified formulas. Um, so I'll go through two uh, basic theories uh, that, that will also be used in the case study. So the first one is the, the base theory of, of uninterpreted functions uh, and inequality. So here you have three constraints with an uninterpreted constant A, an uninterpreted function F. And um, the question is whether there's a solution to A and F that solves both equalities and the disequality. Um, Okay, so how does a solver uh, get around to um, uh, checking whether it's feasible? The first step is to introduce uh, a name for every subterm uh, and, uh, and capture these names with their definitions. So that's done on the line uh, below the equations and the inequations. And now the equations and inequations are given just using the names. Then the, the, the second step is to uh, apply union find to uh, merge equivalence classes of what is asserted equal. So A, V2, and V3 will be put in the same class. Uh, v, V1 is not yet uh, in, in that same class. So um, the second step is to apply congruence rule. So the congruence rule says that if you have the arguments of, uh, of a, the, a function, are equal, then the results are also equal. Uh, so uh, the, the congruence rule gets applied uh, using a efficient data structure known as an equality graph or e-graph. And um, that can apply these congruence rules with n log n overhead. Uh, and so after we apply this congruence rule, we'll see that uh, the red A and the green uh, V1 are now in the same class. So that's a contradiction. So we proved uh, that this is infeasible. So, so, um, so just uh, highlighting the, the main uh, features of, of what the equality solver uh, does in the uh, context of SMT is it has to produce proofs or, uh, that are then used to propagate literals. Uh, it also has to work incrementally as assertions are pushed during search and, and then uh, popped uh, when you backtrack. Uh, now, the other theory is uh, bit vectors. And in the uh, main incarnation uh, uh, still is uh, the, the thing that still works uh, better is to compile them into bit, uh, SATs. So here's an example of bit vector addition. Um, and it, you can implement uh, addition of bit vectors or machine arithmetic using a, uh, an, a ripple carry adder. Um, and so the relation between X and Y and the output can be given by a set of equations that can then be compiled into clauses. And uh, so the, the uh, so handling of bit vectors is essentially compiling into sets. And uh, this, this has the benefit of providing efficient uh, finite domain reasoning. Um, the, um, the, the places where the SAT encoding breaks down is uh, when you have, uh, uh, say, nonlinear um, multipliers, or you have essentially um, uh, linear arithmetic, where you could use simplex uh, um, uh, much um, and, and lib methods much more uh, efficiently. Uh, I, I would also say that uh, there's one uh, part that's not SAT about bit vectors. Uh, we can uh, reason about equalities between big vectors at the level of 
equality reasoning. So there's not, not everything is just completely put into sets. So there's some module, some element of equality reasoning between bit layers, and we exploit that. Um, so, uh, so as I said, the Holy Grail was combining theories. And this has a long history going back to the uh, 70s uh, where uh, Greg Nelson and Derek Oppen uh, developed a, a suitable framework, set of conditions for which disjoint theories could be combined generally. Uh, so, the, so if the theories satisfy some preconditions, then you can uh, combine these uh, theories without really uh, digging into uh, details of what each theory, uh, so the other theory doesn't need to know about each other. Um, but uh, the, the question was how to uh, realize this efficiently. Uh, so another thread uh, was uh, started by Schostag that essentially used uh, rewriting techniques to combine theories when they could, could re combine the rewriter from one theory and another into a confluent uh, terminating uh, rewrite system. Uh, the, um, and even in my thesis, I looked at this rewriting idea with constraints. The, the sad part of this is that it was notoriously complicated and essentially all um, approaches uh, had various bugs. Uh, so the, the big uh, breakthrough in the um, late 90s and, and early 2000s was uh, take, making backtracking cheap. Um, so make, make guessing cheap, relatively cheap, and then you can always backtrack and learn. So this changed uh, uh, the equation of what, what to focus on. Uh, so the, the first ones to uh, exploit this were um, by Brutumeso and, and uh, co-authors uh, in what they call the delayed theory uh, combination. And then uh, when we started working on set three, so Leonardo de Mora and I uh, worked on set three, um, we, uh, we did, uh, discovered a, say, a bottleneck with a delayed theory combination and, and, and uh, developed something called model-based theory combination that I will um, explain here. Uh, so the pre-existing methods was this uh, show stack where you uh, propagate all implied equalities with the uh, rewriting if you can, and that's complicated and co costly. The delayed theory combination, what it does, it says if you have uh, variables, uh, so if you have a variable that's both used, uh, say, for arithmetic and used under an uninterpreted function, so it's, it's shared between two theories, then you, uh, for every such variable, you create an equality literal, and then you let the SAT solver figure out, okay, are these equal or different? So the SAT solver gives a configuration and then the theories check the configuration and report back whether they have an unset uh, configuration or, or, or happy. The, the problem with that is that uh, you compile up front a quadratic number of equalities and uh, in this way pollute the search space. So the, the search space in the worst case grows exponentially in the, in the, in the size of the problem instance. Uh, so the, the model-based idea in a nutshell is to say, okay, each theory will, will work independently and then build a model uh, with respect to the theory. So the arithmetic theory assigns integers to variables and the uninterpreted function theory creates lookup tables for functions. And then they, um, in, in, uh, in isolation, they will decide what's equal. And so if the arithmetic theory decides that two variables are equal, it will create an equality literal, um, if it doesn't already exist, of course, and then uh, introduce that into the search space. And now if the other theory doesn't agree with that equality literal, it will backtrack. So it's a lazy way of implementing this uh, delayed theory combination. Um, so uh, I, I claim this is, this is a first instance of where we exploited this uh, searching for a model or uh, and dually creating a proof uh, in, in, you know, in the context of SMT. Um, now there are more profound instances of this. Now equality propagation is also important. So here I'll, how, here I'll give an example of uh, some cheap method we use for equality propagation 
uh, for arithmetic. And this is useful, especially when we have formulas that combine arithmetic with other theories. Uh, for uh, arithmetic in isolation, it, it seems to be mo mostly overhead. Okay, so, uh, so in this example, uh, X equals Z, because you have two equalities that X plus one equals Y and Y minus one equals Z. So, um, so, uh, so let, let's assume that we asserted some equalities like this. Uh, so now they are asserted as inequalities. Uh, there's a variable U that's uh, lower bounded by one and upper bounded by one. Um, so these three, uh, four, in, uh, five inequalities basically represents what's on top of the turnstile. Um, so, and, and now the solver sees these equality, it sees these inequalities as uh, equations. So uh, in the simplex, in the dual simplex tableau, you have stack variables. And then you have bounds, uh, bound constraints on, on the slacks. Um, so after pivoting, uh, you have isolated basic variables, X, Y, and S3. And, um, and then you can apply bounds propagation and you can learn that all of these uh, slack variables are, have to be zero. So at this point, uh, you are basically reconstructed the three uh, the two uh, equalities are, are across the, the line. And, um, and th then you can subtract um, uh, you know, the right-hand sides from each other and you get uh, this equality. So, so the, the point here is that U is one and minus one and is two, they're all constant. Uh, and now you have this, uh, you will get the, the, uh, the right, um, since these, uh, since you only have one con since you only have one variable and the rest is a constant bounded, you essentially have an offset equality and, and you can uh, chain through these offset equalities. Um, but it has uh, some cost of doing this equality inference. Uh, so uh, if, you, if we do the equality inference literally, we'll uh, start adding uh, and subtracting offsets. And uh, and uh, with the uh, arbitrary precision uh, arithmetic representation, this can be a substantial overhead. Uh, so, uh, so this is the same example just summarized. Um, so the, the idea in uh, efficiently finding these equalities is to um, realize that uh, at any given uh, point, the, uh, you have an assignment to the variables. So the variables have uh, values. Um, so for example, X could be three and Y could be four and uh, uh, sorry, X would be three set four and Y could be three again. So X and Y have the same numeric, are assigned the same value by the solver, but they're also uh, always equal. So in the current instance, they, they have the same value. And when they are, uh, when you can uh, chase from X to Y using these offset equalities and they have the same values, um, we don't have to look at the offsets. Um, so, um, so this gives us, us a saving, you know, doing, detecting equalities without uh, doing any arithmetic because we have candidate values. So that's one little idea to illustrate that we also do uh, say equality propagation as well doing search. So, so that gives an, gives an appetizer to, to some of the techniques used in the solving. So now uh, going to the application. So it's been used in, in various application domains. Um, so uh, some years ago, I, 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 um, I was visiting New York. So there's a, when NFL uh, uh, schedules their, their games, they sit, sit or their season, they sit in a conference room uh, for two or three months uh, straight and then uh, work on, on uh, scheduling problems. And, and, and as I've gone around, I think uh, uh, the, the basically uh, uh, yeah, I, I see a lot of people who have been the same place over the years. So, uh, um, so they have a tough uh, scheduling problem. For that, I, I've developed a distributed uh, solver that used uh, cube and conquer uh, techniques, but that's a whole different story. 
Um, the, the, um, I will talk, give two examples of applications. One is uh, within Microsoft Azure. Uh, here we check uh, configurations uh, in data centers. Uh, so, um, so the idea is a data center have top of rack uh, switches where the uh, servers sit. And then you have uh, in the um, say, say uh, current data center designs, uh, two or three layers of uh, routers that sit on top of the, the clusters. So what you see here is that the, the two left green uh, top of rack switches sit in the same cluster. So they can reach each other uh, using only one level of, of router uh, bouncing traffic uh, among one level of routers. You will also see that they have redundant paths so there, there are three, uh, four, sorry, four different routers that can each that can do the same uh, route uh, that that can get you from the same source to the same destination. Now, if you want to reach the the leftmost to the rightmost router, you have to go through the uh, the level three uh, routers as well. But uh, you you uh, the preference is that traffic should not bounce up. Uh, and down uh, doing this traffic. So there's a notion of a shortest path. There's a notion of redundant paths. And um, so how do you check that the, the current uh, configurations running in the data center satisfies these requirements? So what we do is what, that we have local contracts for each routing table. And uh, when we have checked these local contracts, uh, the composition of the uh, contracts we check uh, guarantee the, uh, the, the, the global contracts. Uh, so this is efficiently solvable. And then we use a uh, set three, four, essentially uh, declarative programming uh, encoding of these contracts. Uh, and and um, so the, the configurations get pulled from the routers and then uh, verified. This is known as uh, control plane verification in the networking community. Uh, so another application is in translation validation. So the Alive 2 tool uh, takes, um, uh, takes programs that are compiled by the LLVM uh, tool chain. And then uh, uh, and the tool chain comprises of several compilation passes or several transformation passes that do micro optimizations. And um, so it takes two versions of, of, micro, of, of code before and after transformation, and then checks that they're equivalent. Uh, so this is used to find uh, compiler bugs. Um, so that's another application. Um, so over the years, uh, the, the, uh, the, the close, we, these are logos of research tools developed uh, in my group, so they're funny logos, uh, but they're basically being drivers for the internals in set three developed over the years. And you'll find a lot of work on quantifiers that, that I will not be talking about here. Uh, so now on to the second part of the talk, uh, which is the uh, case study on virtual plant design automation. And, and this is really an ongoing collaboration. Uh, so, so I have uh, weekly meetings with the group in the, in the, uh, in, in the manufacturer. And um, it's also, as, as several talks were mentioning, Everything is a moving target, you know, requirements change, and it's part of the game, of course, and not, not a surprise. Uh, and um, so the, the virtual plant uh, um, problem in a nutshell uh, is uh, illustrated here. So you have a production line with cars, and uh, Within a given station, you have uh, three blue stations illustrated. Within a given station, there can be a set of operators working on a car. Uh, so you can have up to eight operators working on a car, but that's too crowded. So you better, better you prefer three or four operators in this example, or you, you prefer some subset of operators. Now operators can move around, so they have some fixed job. And then uh, depending on what process you assign uh, to a station, uh, it must be done by some operator. So, so, uh, so if the process is to uh, 
put on uh, some uh, front sticker, then you can only do it in the front of the car, obviously. So, um, so that gives some uh, uh, constraints on you know, what, where operators can be relative to what they do. Um, I mentioned there's a notion of process. Each process have, is divided into several tasks uh, that are uh, done in, in some sequence. So in a nutshell, we are assigning the tasks to stations and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, then subject to the station, the operator uh, that can handle the, the task. And um, there are several ob objectives. I'm mentioning two of them just to give an idea, uh, but uh, you, you really have a multi-objective problem uh, here, depending on what uh, the, the, the designers think is, is uh, relevant. Um, so uh, the, the, the challenge of, of those who manage the plans is that it takes several weeks to develop a, a manual plan uh, without guarantees of any optimality. And there's even uh, so, so, uh, several congestion, um, uh, uh, there, there's a risk for, uh, the, the manual solutions essentially introduce congestion uh, when it's not necessary. Uh, so do, the experience I would categorize in two parts. There's a part that, um, that deals with domain engineering, and there's a part of solving the problem. And uh, I would make the case that by now that uh, it's a solved problem, uh, the, 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 the real action is, is in the domain engineering. Um, although uh, solving the problem wasn't obvious uh, from the outset, and we went through several iterations. Uh, to, to uh, find a, a way to, to efficiently solve and encode the problem. And I will describe that. Um, but uh, I think there, there's a big value in, in the domain engineering aspect. Uh, so I'll talk, uh, mention three parts. Uh, the first is developing a mathematical precise model. Uh, and, and here what I um, allude to is what is the language that you, what's the formalism that you use for capturing the, uh, uh, say the requirements that come in from discussing with the, with the operator. So the operators will, will write in English prose what the requirements are. And um, the, uh, so I'll make a claim that we, we can capture these requirements at a fairly uh, precise or fairly direct level uh, compared to the English requirements by using uh, language features available in SMT solvers and in particular uninterpreted functions. So, um, so if you have a, a height requirement on a station, so if you have different operators or different tasks being run on a station, some tasks are under the car, others are over the car, um, you, you, you may not want to mix those that are uh, on the same station. You may prefer to just work in the same height of a station. Uh, so we can assign the height, the maximal height you used at a given station, or the minimal height, uh, and, um, and use a function as opposed to uh, one variable per station. And I'll explain why, why I think it's a, a, an advantage. Now the, the constraints can now so now the function max height takes the assignment of a process and maps that to a height. And you can then uh, express a constraint on that. And then uh, we use uh, bit vectors for finite domains. Uh, the, uh, now, there's also bugs in the data entries that we get. So the data entries are, are, are done manually. They're done by multiple different people. And, uh, and it's done without a global, you can't have a global view when, once you enter uh, the requirements for an isolated process. But a program can have a global view and uh, we can check, we can find bugs in the data entries uh, and we're basically treating these data entries as if it's like a piece of software. We check invariants of it and, uh, and, and um, find, um, say, say, um, so bogus, uh, uh, so 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 in software uh, verification, there's a notion of finding 
the the um, the provenance of why uh, why do you have some um, what's what's a possible path of a program repair? So what what are the uh, instructions that are relevant to a particular bug? Uh, and that uh, maps into unsatisfiable core extraction. So we basically have two methods. So one is uh, writing uh, programs and scripts that check uh, cycle acyclicity of graphs. And the other is to uh, find these um, infeasible uh, data entries uh, by running the, the data entries against our former model and finding unsatisfiable cores and communicating those back. Um, so uh, you could, visualization, I think, is, is well known in the operations research community as, as uh, quite uh, useful for uh, debugging models. And, and we've also used uh, the graph tools to visualize these production lines. So just by visual inspection, you can weed out quite a bit of, of, uh, of, uh, of data entry issues. So now comes the uh, second part of the talk, uh, which is maybe what, what uh, people here are most uh, passionate about, which is the solver engineering aspect. Um, and um, so uh, there, there's, you know, um, not, not everything is, is uh, straightforward in this world. So I'll say there's a fly in the ointment and wasp in the rose. Uh, and what is it? Uh, so uh, when you have a model where with order of thousand processes and a thousand stations and 10,000 tasks in, in that order, maybe eight or 10 operators per station, and uh, you do a MIP uh, style encoding of this where you uh, say, uh, introduce a decision variable for a cross product of such domains, you end up with a, a large number of, of uh, binary variables. And uh, yeah, so if we were encoding the domains directly, we would get hundreds of millions, uh, uh, if not billions of variables. Um, so uh, the, the secret sauce here, or not so secret sauce, is to use the uninterpreted functions to avoid uh, this encoding up front. So we get an encoding that uh, is at the same size uh, as the database entries. Um, the, the second uh, fly in the ointment is the handling of scheduling constraints. Uh, so C3 doesn't have any built-in uh, solver for scheduling constraints. And if we spell out the uh, cycle time constraints for, for stations that you, know, you can only fit so many tasks in a station, uh, the stations have bounded time. Um, so, so they're like a knapsack, and then you can overflow uh, a, a process only between two stations. So you can uh, spread a process between three stations. You want some bounded overflow of where you put your process. Uh, so this can be expressed using uh, uh, time constraints. So uh, e expanding these to linear inequalities is, is uh, impractical. Um, so what, what we uh, ended up doing was to program these constraints directly as constraint handlers and then use callbacks from the solver. So I call this uh, constraints as code. Um, so we could, yes, you could call it like an ad hoc uh, scheduling constraint um, in this case, or knapsack constraint. Uh, so uh, th this goes back to the mathematical modeling um, just emphasizing that um, there, there's uh, in the formal methods community, uh, these formalisms that map into s and are, are say, say heavily uh, um, embraced over the years. And, and, and I think it's a, it's a good uh, opportunity for people from formal methods community uh, to uh, get engaged in operations research. CPA or uh, the uh, so what we to summarize what we then do with these constraints is that uh, when uh, then we have these uninterpreted functions 
uh, we solve for the functions. Um, so, and, and, and the selling point is that it allows the succinct encoding of constraints. When we, uh, each domain uh, is, uh, is a set of bit vectors or is a bit vector domain. So each variable is a big vector. Uh, and then uh, that maps into the SAT solver. Uh, this is an example of another uh, equality you can derive by congruence reasoning uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, so the uh, constraints as code, uh, as I uh, mentioned, to, to illustrate that in more detail, what you see here is a um, artificial example with a, um, with a cardinality constraint. Uh, it's a summation over i and j, where they range from zero to 500. And then for each pair of i, j, uh, there's a constraint. So if you expand this into, um, if you expand the summation directly, you end up with uh, hundreds of thousands of atomic formulas. Um, so, but if you treat the constraint as code, uh, there's no extra uh, formulas, but you get a callback when you have an assignment to either to, to one of these X's. And then you can check the assignment. Uh, you can check the sums of all other previously assigned X's and uh, accumulate the summation incrementally. And when the summation uh, overflows, you can generate a conflict uh, as it's done here. So the, the ability to, to soft code uh, this, this mini solver, uh, I think it was one uh, uh, good takeaway from this uh, experience. Um, so I, I never plan, uh, well, I don't really plan to go over this uh, in, in much detail other to give uh, the, the overview that um, we tried several different strategies over time. So the, the first uh, version, we, we did some uh, pre-solving. Uh, so we would take a small batch of processes and assign them and then take a next batch. And uh, we'd also use uh, integer uh, domains. And uh, that, that was uh, impractical. The, the second impractical um, approach was to uh, just assign one process at a time and then greedily uh, see if you could, how many you could assign. Uh, the, in the uh, CP world, uh, there, there's a question, do you, do you use a SAT solver? Or do you use a MIP solver as, as the, the base engine? Um, and, and so one way of emulating using a, a MIP style solvers base engine was in take three, where we um, uh, would have special, uh, do some case splitting, uh, not, not even uh, delegate constraint handling, but also do case splitting uh, by, by externally. And that's, that all became unnecessary when, when we moved to bit vectors and the uh, global constraint handlers. So now we can uh, solve the, the, the problems that come in in a few minutes. Um, and uh, now, not too optimal, but just the first feasible in a few minutes and then optimal uses a, a very naive branch and bound strategy currently, but this is still good enough for, uh, so, so you don't uh, put a new car plant out every day, it's every half year. So it takes a, a day or so to, to converge. Um, so uh, so the, the, the ongoing question during this conference, I, I prepared this slide well before the conference, okay. <laughs> is, uh, um, is uh, uh, can you use uh, SMT for operations research? I, I say the, the, um, the core technologies uh, that I call the conflict-directed close learning uh, CDCL uh, over theories, um, is, is already employed in CPSET. Um, so the, in a way this already happened. Um, may, maybe one, one uh, a set of takeaways relative to that uh, would be that uh, we can offer uninterpreted functions and bit vectors. Uh, yeah, please encode with bit vectors, not integers uh, for these kind of combinatorial domains. And, uh, and then, uh, use constraints as code at this point for um, 
as an uh, as a backup for not having a built-in uh, uh, say scheduling uh, predicates. Um, so there are, there are a number of directions to take from here, which is uh, one thing we don't uh, invest in in the SMT world is uh, uh, neighborhood search. Um, but but this could be a, a good uh, question. Can you do that model of theories? Um, another takeaway from this experience is to, uh, uh, I, I realized that uh, we need to modernize the course. So three, so I embarked on that. Um, so one thing we can't do with our current core is to do uh, do well is in processing. So in SAT solvers, uh, so pre-processing has the biggest effect, but you can also get some uh, increments by periodically uh, in process. And uh, there are cases where you could have profound effect in the SMT world with the quantified bench uh, examples. Um, now, Z3 does sound MIP. It uses infinite precision integers. This, um, this works well on the benchmarks we get from the SMT world. It works horribly on, <laughs> on everything else. Um, and uh, so, uh, but, but since the, but, but we even built a um, MIP solver based on LRU decomposition and, and the classical uh, operate, uh, linear programming, uh, but threw it away because it was useless, useless in our uh, scenarios. Um, but one thing uh, I'm in, uh, in the process of doing is to develop a specialized LP solver, but for modular arithmetic, uh, so which is bit vector. Uh, so if you do proper bit vector semantics of arithmetic, and you translate that into integer arithmetic, uh, the solver is hopeless. Um, so you get these big modular coefficients. Um, so having a specialized solver seems to be uh, much more preferred. Uh, so uh, I'm at the end of the talk. So here's a summary. Um, so I talked about uh, set three, you know, efficient solver, um, and gave examples of theories, in particular uninterpreted functions where congruence, closure, and union find are the main, say, theory solving components, then bit vectors, and uh, then constra constraints as code. Um, I uh, talked about uh, the experiences and um, the, uh, the main bulk of what we do is, is I would say, or well, big value add is, is doing the data validation um, as, as well as you know, the solving can save money. Uh, but I think the data validation also makes, uh, makes the process sound. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it was really a very nice talk. So I think, especially for the community uh, who is not working as MT solving, I think it's uh, a lot of um, nice information. So let's see if we have questions. So we have here in Vienna first, maybe Tobias. Yeah. That's the camera. <laughs> Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first would be, um, what exactly is the benefit of modeling with interpreted functions? Or is just using the quality logic is just better or? So it's what? much more succinct. Okay, so it's just- So, a, so you, you, you save uh, quadratic or so over here. So the succinctness uh, okay. buys you a lot. So, so I actually have a, um, another example I got uh, more recently from DNA want to uh, encode something with DNA sequences. And it's also this assignment problem of, you know, is there a function from one domain to another? Okay. And, and uh, so, so first we tried set encoding and, and uh, with uh, uh, unate or binary. And, and, um, and then uh, after some time of, of uh, Hitting that uh, said, okay, let's try uninterpreted functions, and it, it was night and day in, in, in what we could do. Okay, thank you. And the other thing, um, at the constraints as code part, if I thought correctly, you only basically you only propagate on the 
conflict, right? So you just you check whether the constraint is, is, is satisfied, and if it's not, then you add a conflict clause. So, so yeah, it's so the error to propagate more, like also in partial solutions. And yeah, yeah. So 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 the API is more general, okay. uh, general than, than the example I gave. I gave the example of where the callback can can issue a conflict. The callback can also issue a propagation. So that's okay. a different option. And uh, yeah, these are the two main options. Yeah, well, it's enough. Okay, thank you. That is it for me. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question from uh, yeah audience here or maybe online? Peter, there is one online. Oh, okay, Peter. so please, Peter. Yeah. You're muted. You are muted, Peter. Okay. Okay, sorry, I didn't hear my name. So uh, it's also going back to the, the uninterpreted functions. At least in the example, you it seemed that you were talking about finite functions. So from uh, some finite enumerator type to another one or a, a pair of enumerator types to another enumerator type. So that kind of thing we can express in CP, although we will um, eagerly construct basically uh, a placeholder for the value of that function at every position. And I'm wondering if that's a, a problem in the domain that you're talking about for the, um, so, for the manufacturing. So, 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 so there's an important thing I didn't mention, which is uh, we also applied Minisync. So we did a separate modeling effort and Minisync works. So, so uh, it's not that you can't do it only with this model, but, but to, get, uh, to get the Minisync with uh, geo, geo code or geo, uh, uh, so Andre Robalchenko did his modeling. Um, he uh, um, applied some model slicing uh, to uh, uh, to to narrow the uh, the the amount of generated constraints. So mm -hmm. so I think so so uh, so he used what channel constraints for for the yeah. Um, but but uh, the um, now when you solve for an uninterpreted function, it will have a solution. It will has this small model property. So in in a sense, it will only need a domain that's as big as number of uh, occurrences. Yeah. So I think that's the question is whether. I like at least the the functions you, you you showed there looked like they were saying for every task and for every machine we have to assign a session or whatever i can't remember the actual example now but uh in, in that case i mean you can write a, in cp you can write an array uh which will essentially encode that function but of course if you don't need to look up many of those function entries ever then the uninterpreted functor was going to be much more efficient because it won't generate. Uh, in CP, we'll generate up front all of these placeholders for the values of that function. Uh, well, yeah, so, so the number of, of potential lookups is, is very large. Uh, so so what, what, uh, what Andre uh, did to reduce the number of potential lookups was basically to um, uh, narrow, narrow the range um, for for given uh, a placeholder, narrow the range that, that is uh, so. For a given value, you would narrow the range where where it's relevant, uh, and then uh, and then it uh, works beautifully. The um, I mean, one one thing is that three does with the uninterpreted functions. It uh, it it has an option to generate axioms for uh, for congruence closure on the fly. Can also generate axioms for transitivity of equality, uh, but these axioms introduce new literals. And for this uh, for this application, I turned it off. So it's it's uh, it's detrimental to create these fresh axioms uh, for this domain. Okay. So the Thank next. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Peter. So the next question is from Roland. Hi, Nicholas. Hi. Uh, this is a related question. So I didn't quite understand really the unintended functions that well, but it seems like, and a bit like what Peter was saying that yes, yeah, so we're using it because it gives some kind of lazy 
I, I shouldn't say lazy evaluation, but you know, we can think of it as lazy evaluation. And, it, and is, is that mainly it? But then, what, uh, but then what happens in the worst case, right? That, you know, what if we need to do full expansion anyway? We don't do full expansion, right? So there are no, uh, it, we, we um, the number of, of uh, literals in the search space is, is constant in the uh, input uh, description. So you, you have some variable apply, uh, function applied to some variable. It, it, it doesn't get instantiated if this variable is zero, if it's one, if it's two. So the number of literals can be kept constant. In the, but, but then that means that some constraints are being ignored, right? Is what? Doesn't that mean that some constraints are being ignored? No. No? OK. okay. So, so uh, basically, uh, the set solver gives an assignment to the literals. If the conjunction of assigned literals is feasible, modulo uh, theory of uninterpreted functions, it has a model. And, and um, so what, the, what happens during the search is that in a given search state, the variable is assigned to some value. But the value is not um, uh, plugged into the function. Maybe that's your. Okay. Is is there is there anything written on this? Don't 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 quite. Close. Proceedings. I mean, uninterpreted oh, is there proceedings. Function, I mean, okay. uninterpreted Sorry, I functions proceedings. are basic in S and T, right? So, uh, and right, so, right. so, uh, so yes, there's lots of written about uninterpreted. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, uh, for for this plant model. Yes, in the proceedings, uh, all uh, twenty six pages that. Uh, Ah, okay. The easy chair okay, great, great, great. allowed me to fill in. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, so uninterpreted functions were, uh, say, discovered for s &T in the late 90s for pipeline verification. So Birch and Dill has a methodology for verifying pipelines. So it, it came into attention at that point. And of course, it was uh, used uh, well before. So they're, they're no, like, I mean, under uh, functions please. occur in logic programming, CLP, everywhere anyway, so. Yeah. Mm. Okay, okay, uh, I'll look it up. Okay, thank you. So is there any other question from audience or online? Okay. If not, then I have, I have some questions. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, but first thing, maybe I know that there are a lot of other SMT solvers. So we also use uh, like MathSat and so on. So, can, can you comment a bit uh, what is the state of the art? So, Z3 is, of course, one of the state of the art, but yeah, so is there, is there is for different problems, is one SMT solver better than other? Or? Uh, so, CVC, now it's called CVC5, has invested in high order reasoning. And I think, I don't think there's other SMT solvers do that. It's uh, so. Um, the uh, CVC and C3 do string reasoning, which I think is still unique among those. Mm -hmm. So that's a niche. Um, MathSat has invested in good uh, arithmetic. So, um, and we have like borrowed, uh, stolen, or <laughs> how to say it, uh, methods for doing nonlinear arithmetic using incrementally linearization. Um, so, uh, the, uh, and, and then uh, the other s and solvers that specialize in, in say just for arithmetic or just for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. verified uh, proof generation. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so we, we used uh, uh, for, for scheduling problem, uh, I think 10 years ago s and and it was very good for one constraint satisfaction problem. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, in that time, uh, bit vector formulation worked the best. It was pretty tricky to model it with bit vectors. So is, is this all usually the case or? or uh... Uh, well, for bit vectors, if you, uh, have, if you overflow and you don't want the overflow, then, then, okay. then, then you're, yeah, have, have that uh, discrepancies. We have internal features that would detect small finite domains and translate them to bit vectors mm -hmm. in some cases. Okay. Uh, it's fairly ad hoc. Um, I, would, I, I noticed that there was a talk, uh, I think yesterday, that compared uh, optimization model theories and CP, and, it, and then I looked at the translation into s &T, and it mixed integers and bit vectors in the same formulation, 
and this is this is essentially a good recipe to kill the solver. Okay. <laughs> it's not, it's, okay. So 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 we expose this uh, vocabulary, rich vocabulary, and some of it is like a shotgun. You can mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, kill the the, the solver. Okay. Um, so so if you can uh, yeah if you can keep if you can keep things pure set, um, much better. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that means because we had another problem with soft constraints, so then SMT was not working for that problem at that time. So is this in general? So you have also the solvers have problems with soft constraints. Um, um, I, I think one thing is a it, it could be a function of what is tuned and, and tested for. Mm -hmm. uh, the the way that uh, soft constraints are used uh, are as, as uh, like mini sets, you have uh, um, assumption literals, and um, and that prevents certain in processing methods, mm -hmm. uh, at least uh, un unless you you uh, keep track of cone of influence and be able to reproduce. That. And I think that's only implemented in in Catacal at this point. Okay. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so soft constraints would prevent certain in processing and pre processing methods. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that, that can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So, the, the challenge, I think, is how do you then have your soft constraints and get to have your uh, good uh, in processing mm -hmm. or pre processing? Okay, so I have one more question, but I will look if there is any other question from audience. Or online, maybe is there any question? Okay, no. So yeah, we are in time. I, okay, but I, I will just have one more question. So if okay. it's a, so, you you explain this combination of theories um, and so on. I, I'm just interested because I, I'm not expert in the, uh, so so the way you combine the uh, the theories with this search space and so on. How how this process works exactly? So you you run them in parallel and then uh, yeah, so uh, so is it, we call it a back board architecture. So so you have a um, the SAT solver and um, the SAT solver assigns literals, and uh, when the literal correspond to some interpreted atom, uh, the uninterpreted function theory sees this atom, so mm -hmm. it sees the equalities and disequalities. Now, if the atom is, is arithmetical, then it uh, dispatches into the arithmetical solver mm -hmm. um, that sees the assignment. And, uh, and then now the solvers, whether they're uninterpreted functions or others, uh, they would create conflicts, which is a subset of the assignments they have seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's, uh, it, it's uh, as if the set solver had that clause magically. Okay. Um, and uh, it can also do uh, like stronger conflict uh, resolution is for pseudo-booleans. Mm -hmm. uh, you can try to do get, get cutting planes. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, we, um, we will close the session. So thanks a lot for your talk. Uh,